Uh, just to for your attention, there will be a plenary uh, talk at uh, 12 o'clock at the Red, down at the Red Pass Auditorium, and it's uh, by uh, Dr. Martel on um, nano robotics. On nano robotics, and also there will, I believe there will be a afterwards there will be a party tonight uh, after this event down in the basement of the Thompson House. So I'll just make you make sure that you're aware of these two events. So. Uh, Let's get this party started. Uh, we're going to have the first presenter. His name is uh, Ethan Buzatu uh, uh, from the Department of Physics with his presentation titled Search for Standard Model Heat Boson at uh, CDF. I believe CDF stands for the Collider Detector at Fermilab. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming here so early to hear about one of the most fundamental questions about the universe, the origin of mass. And just to put things into perspective, we have to see that the universe is made up of structures that are made up of substructures that are made up of even smaller things. And each one of these different layers is studied by different fields of science. So you have, for example, as you go from cells to molecules, and then to atoms, to nuclei, uh, to protons and neutrons, you go from uh, chemistry, uh, from biology to chemistry, to atomic physics, to nuclear physics, uh, and to particle physics. But then, this is what the science is all about. But then they go a, deep, uh, a deeper level, and the protons and the neutrons they are made up of something even smaller called quarks. As, as you see here, a nucleon is made up of three quarks, and these are the co fundamental components of the universe. These are the fundamental blocks of matter, and this is what we study in the field that we call elementary particle physics. But even if this is all we know, we know this is not all that easy in the universe. So keep in mind, this is only 5% of the regular universe. There is also dark matter and dark energy, which we don't discuss in this talk. So if you wanted to create the universe yourself, how would you do it? What would be the recipe of the universe? So this is what we're going to talk today about. And as you see the recipe of the universe, we need the ingredients, which are exactly these quarks, these electrons, and all the other elementary particles as they are, plus you would need something to keep them together, some forces to stick them together. And these are the four fundamental interactions in the universe. So electromagnetic force is familiar to you, it keeps atoms inside molecules, it keeps nuclei and electrons inside atoms. Strong force is the one that keeps protons and neutrons inside nuclei to keep it stable, but also those quarks, those fundamental blocks of matter, keep them together to form protons and, uh, and neutrons. And then you have the weak force, this is the one that makes radioactivity, so transforms atoms from one type to the other type, like the dream of alchemy, right? And then you have the gravitational force, but does not act at the fundamental atomic level, it is too weak. All that thing goes to be a theory of the standard model of particle physics and their interactions. It is the best uh, theory humanity ever developed, at least this electromagnetic theory, uh, verified experimentally up to 12 digits, even more. And uh, this is still not all we believe it is, even if it has to the test of time. And uh, for 30 years, all the experiments have confirmed this theory. There is at least one thing missing, and this is the origin of mass. Why is this important? Well, if particles didn't have mass, they would all be like the photons. Photons do not have mass. So they would go around the universe at the speed of light. So if they move around the universe at the speed of light, all of them, they couldn't stay together to form those protons and neutrons that form us. So it couldn't exist. Protons and neutrons do not exist. Nuclei don't exist. Atoms don't exist. Molecules don't exist. Cells don't exist. We don't exist. So this is, I hope I convinced you, is really a fundamental question. If we were to build a universe, we would have to find how to build a mass. So there is a theory, 45 years old, from Peter Higgs, a Scottish physicist, which is called the Higgs mechanism. But this theory, in order to prove it is correct or false, you have to verify its other predictions as well. And its other predictions are this new elementary fundamental particle, not made of anything else, called the Higgs boson, or the Higgs particle. And we are searching experimentally for this particle to test the validity of the theory. So as you see, these are those ingredients, the quarks and the electrons and the particles like them, and these are the forces, so those recipe to keep the universe together. This is known, this is known, the Higgs boson is not known. So as you see, there is a large disparity of masses, which we need to explain, and this is what the theory does. Uh, bear in mind that particles are points, right? This is just to represent their masses through their surface. But they're all points and elementary particles. So let's see how do these particles actually get mass. How does this Higgs mechanism allow particles to acquire mass? Think of the universe, even if it's vacuum in the outer space, it is not a vacuum. It is made up of something called a Higgs field that is everywhere. And as particles pass through the universe, they feel a friction, they feel viscosity. So they are slowed down. The more slowed down they are, the more inertia they get, the more mass they get. But to see an analogy from everyday life, 
Let's look over here. So you have this Higgs field everywhere in the universe, represented by these many, many people in the room. And then you have a known person, a celebrity, entering the room, which means our particle. And the person wants to cross the room. But as it crosses the room, all the people gather around that person, like the paparazzi would do, you know, and slow that person down. So they form a group around that person. The person has a problem of advancing very quickly, so it is slowed down. So it gets inertia. It gets mass. What is even more amazing is that the Higgs particle can give mass to itself. How would you do that? What would be the analogy? Instead of the person going inside the room, you would have a, a, a rumor, an information, you know? And as the information crosses around the room, the people would still gather to read it. S imagine a gossip magazine thrown into the room. People would gather around it to read it. And they would group together and would not be able to move quickly. So they acquire mass. So the Higgs mechanism allows uh, particles, but also the Higgs particle, to acquire mass and explain why we can exist today. But how do we look experimentally for that? Because this is what we do, right? We do experiments. So then what we do is we go to particle accelerators. This is the one at Te the Tevatron at the Fermilab National Laboratory in the United States near Chicago. And here in a six uh, kilometer circumference, we collide here protons and antiprotons, so matter and antimatter, close to the speed of light. And this creates new particles that decay. And hopefully some of those decays would be the Higgs boson. So it acts like a huge uh, microscope. You need huge machines to study the smallest components of the universe. And once this collision applied, we use something like a huge digital camera, which in our case the collider detector Fermilab. And this is how it looks like. As a beam of protons comes this way, a beam of antiprotons this way, there is a collision here in the center of the detector. New particles are produced, hopefully the Higgs boson also. And then they decay, and their decay products would go through the detector radially in this way. So as they go through different layers of the detector, as you see here from left to right, different types of particles leave different types of traces. So we do come into the detective work and identify what particles are here are the electrons, the quarks, the muons, the cousins of the electrons, or the photons, and they have different type, types of traces. And then we do detective work to infer from these final state particles what are the initial state particles that are produced, which were the Higgs boson, which were the things that were mimicking the Higgs boson, so signal and background, signal as noise, and as always in science. Bear in mind that a human person would be just like that in the real life. So it's a really huge detector, larger than this room. So now let's look how this Higgs particle actually would look like, right? So here you have a proton and an antiproton collider. A proton is made up of three quarks. They are the fundamental blocks of matter. An antiquark is an antimatter from the antiproton. And as they collide, they pr produce a particle that decays into two different types of particles. One of them is the Higgs boson, our treasure that we want to look for. And then they decay uh, in other particles, like an electron and a neutrino, and here a pair of quark and antiquark. So as you see, this is our treasure. And think of this as a road. From kilometer 100 to 200, along the road somewhere, a treasure is buried. So what we do is we dig inside the Earth of different uh, samples, uh, of different distances, and we search for this treasure. And imagine that the theory predicts that three meters underground, you have the Higgs boson. But then, if you dig all the way to five meters and don't find anything, you say it is not here. So you exclude that region. So we have a huge space of possibility for this particle, and we want to exclude it uh, slowly. Now we are lucky. Some experiments before us excluded all the way to kilometer 114. And then, indirectly, let's say we had some friends in the secret services. They didn't get their hands dirty. They didn't dig inside Earth, but they put different information together from different uh, explorers. And from 185 onwards, they excluded. Now, what does this actually mean, this kilometer analogy that I had? See, it's GeV, giga electron volt. And this is energy, right? And which is equivalent of roughly one mass of the proton or one mass of the neutron. So we can put that together and see this fundamental particle, not made of anything else, elementary, fundamental. What would be the equivalent of mass in terms of some atoms that we are familiar with, right? Uh, so if we put it together in terms of the periodic table of elements, you could see that this uh, low mass region from 114 to 135 corresponds to the masses of these heavy atoms from antimonium all the way to cesium, and if you wanted, um, and if you wanted the, um, the high mass from 135 to 185, it is so many, all these lanthanides, all the way to Voltron. So see a fundamental particle as massive as heavy atoms made up of hundreds of protons and neutrons that are made up of three parts. This is what we are going to talk about. And as you see, so if this is the mass, you have different ways 